Good evening, everyone. Now is excited to continue the Topics in Peripheral Nerve Stimulation webinar series. Please take a moment to fill out the on-screen poll. Today's topic is suprascapular nerve. We as a company recognize the therapy expansion opportunities of PNS. We look to collaborate with all interested parties to further expertise, share experiences, and grow the PNS practicing community. Now the medical is excited now to pass off the agenda of this webinar to our physician partners, Drs. Gulati, Vali Mohammed, and Arukumar. Thank you very much, Jeff. And um, welcome everyone to our wonderful discussion on how to use a peripheral nerve stimulator and specifically the NALU system uh, for shoulder-related pain. I'm Amit Gulati. And uh, I just want to discuss the agenda for a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll be talking first about the results of that poll question. Um, and after that, we'll sort of spend a few minutes just talking about the actual system, some of the great advantages that NALU has brought into uh, from an engineering standpoint to really give us a very sophisticated peripheral nerve system um, for our patients. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Dr. Vali Mohammed, uh, who will be talking briefly on, on the appropriate patients to discuss when considering um, using this system for shoulder-related pain syndromes, and then go a little bit into the anatomy as well and some optimization techniques um, for this. And Dr. Arul Kumar, then we'll talk about an experience that he has, the vast experience he brings to the table when dealing with shoulder pain, and also uh, some very interesting cases how um, he's really helped some of his patients in his practice using the NALU system. Um, finally, we'll end with a Q and question and answer session and another poll question. Um, but before I start, I'll turn it over to Jeff, who'll give us the results of the um, poll question on the next slide. Ah, so very interesting. So we see here that there's a significant number of people that are not currently implanting um, the peripheral nerve layer system. So uh, from that aspect, it's good to introduce the system to you. Um, but there's a quite uh, a few with that are, um, have a vast experience, so hopefully we'll take advantage of that and have a good discussion afterwards on how to optimize uh, targeting some of the neural targets that innervate the shoulder, and all of us can chime in on our experiences um, regarding this. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and so again, I'll start with the uh, system itself and some of the very key components and really some of the technological innovations that we have uh, for this device. On the left, you can see both the actual wire, the lead um, with its contacts. Uh, what's really innovative here is you have multiple choices uh, for use in your peripheral nerve stimulator system. So we have a four contact system and an eight contact system that we take in from spinal cord stimulation and also a four contact system that has tines if you're very concerned about movement across a joint, for example, to keep uh, your peripheral nerve stimulator leads in place. Attached to that uh, is going to be a, that wire is going to go to the IPG. Now, it's interesting that we use the very small, but very compact, but very sophisticated IPG that's going to be a rectifier. So we'll take the energy input from the external energy source and convert it into numerous waveforms that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, these IPG, is very small. For those of you that still use change, and I know it's getting very few of us, uh, it's about the size of a dime. So you can imagine uh, it's a much smaller IPG than a standard uh, internal battery, such as a spinal cord stimulator system. On the right side is the actual disk, the actual power generator, um, and has a lot of the information and communication and electronics that will help you, uh, help the patient kind of decide what waveforms um, it's going to see. Now, what's probably most important here is that a lot of our systems um, have their own remote control. Um, with the NALU system, it actually runs uh, through Bluetooth as we're using either an uh, Apple iOS uh, or you can use Android. And so you can communicate with it without having a secondary uh, device to actually communicate with, this, um, with the uh, system. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have here is an image of what's actually happening to a patient. Some of the innovations really is that because the IPG is small and the leads are extremely flexible, 
you have the ability to really put this device uh, internally in a lot of different positions, even for the same neural target. So should you have a, aberrant anatomy or something, you might have to position your lead a little bit differently, but you have the flexibility of both the lead and the IPG to really put them in different locations. And what that means is, um, allows you to decide where a patient is gonna put the external disc. So to put it in perspective, that disc has to be in contact with the skin um, and the IPG will be under the skin, roughly a centimeter, two centimeters tops, and they'll communicate with each other. Now, how does that disc adhere to the skin? Uh, will they use the same technology, the same adhesive that patients use for colostomy? Um, that will be adhered to the skin and you'll put the disc on that. So therefore, the communication occurs. Uh, the disc doesn't really move unless you peel off the um, adhesive and there's a special spray for that. But the planning is, is that you will decide with the patient where you want to put the disc, what's most comfortable for you from both a comfort standpoint and also from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, this gives you a lot of different um, options of where the disc can be and where your IPG can be uh, without the needs of any other device, assisted devices to hold that in place. So a lot of flexibility uh, where the disc goes, uh, also a lot of flexibility where you can put this device throughout the body as well. Uh, next um, slide, please. Um, what they've done with the technology is not only is Nalu a peripheral nerve stimulator innovator, but also a spinal cord stimulator innovator. And what they've done is taken the best ideas from spinal cord stimulation, the wants that we need for an optimized peripheral nerve stimulator system and put it together. So from a spinal cord stimulator system, uh, we bring in a much smaller IPG, but we have to think about what uh, currently a spinal cord stimulator systems are doing, which is they're giving a lot of different waveforms, a lot of different configurations and capabilities. We're taking those same ideas and putting it into a peripheral nerve stimulator system. Uh, again, because you can have two leads and multiple, system, uh, multiple leads with four or eight contacts, you have different combinations that are achievable. Um, also, similar to a spinal cord stimulator system, you can do a full trial with this system. So in other words, you can put the leads in the location you want it to be, and the patient can try some of these settings and have a true sense of what the system was capable of doing over a seven day period, um, et cetera. Uh, you can do the same thing about checking the action, the device is actually working with impedance checks and measurements. And probably the most important thing, because the IPG is, doesn't have the electric components, the actual battery, it can last a lot longer. We're talking 18 years, you can have the knowledge system in place and a lot of the brain work is being done on the disc itself. So the disc can be optimized and some of these things can be improved upon with software updates um, throughout the longevity of the system, which is 18 years. We take those ideas from spinal cord stimulator systems, apply that to a peripheral nerve stimulator system once, which is small size. You can place these wires next to a nerve and have flexibility with joints and things that are moving so they don't break or fracture. Because they're small, they're less cumbersome for a patient and they can be placed in a multitude of locations and really bring those advantages that we want in peripheral nerve stimulation and the advantage of spinal cord stimulation and bringing you the now loop peripheral nerve stimulation as a result. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we see here is taking those ideas from spinal cord stimulator systems and really taking the advantage of the waveforms and bring it to peripheral nerve stimulation. So we see the current conventional therapies that are available. Clearly we have tonic capabilities. Uh, you can set your frequencies, uh, 60 Hertz, 80 Hertz, um, but some clever things you can even do with this system. You can do some current steering so you can optimize how much current each contact receives. Uh, you can do some pulse dosing so you can have low and high dose settings. You can even put a delay in between the pulses, so to speak. Um, but you also have some advanced therapies. Uh, we're bringing some really clever ideas from spinal cord stimulation, such as burst stimulation. And obviously, we can control some of the variables that regard, with regards to peripheral, uh, with regards to burst stimulation, and that you can do that with the NALU system as well. Um, clearly, there's some really good work by NALU, really working with their pulse stimulation pattern. Uh, it's really their own proprietary waveform and system. Uh, it's really has some excellent outcomes in spinal cord stimulation, and they brought that over into peripheral nerve stimulation as well. Now, their proprietary waveform can be used alone uh, or it can be used as a pair to another uh, therapy. So, for example, you could theoretically have a low dose tonic stimulation and your PSP or your pulse stimulation pattern, and um, that would be very helpful. Uh, to our patients and they have a lot of different combinations. You can have different combinational therapies. Uh, they do something clever when you have 
with the disc, you can even, when you put the disc on for the first time, you can have one therapy for one hour, then another therapy for seven hours. So if a patient plans to do some activity for an hour, uh, they can have a different setting without, without having to change it with their programming even. Uh, and then after that one hour is completed, it can revert back to another therapy. So uh, it's very clever in what they're trying to do, what's achievable with their system. And it gives you a lot of different options and a lot of different things to play with when you're trying to optimize this for your peripheral nurse and measure system. Uh, with that, next slide, please. I'm going to introduce Dr. Vali Mohammed, a dear friend and colleague um, who's been with us for many years in uh, WAPMU, graduating from the Brig. I got a wonderful practice now in the New Jersey area, and he's really going to focus on the shoulder, the anatomy, how to identify the best patients for this therapy. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Gaudi. I appreciate that, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. So I'm going to be charged with kind of going through an algorithm here for you and patient identification as well as anatomy. So with that, let's jump right in. Next slide, please. So with shoulder pain, um, our treatment algorithm in the past has been somewhat limited. Um, in the past, we would have done steroid injections, and we all know that with repetitive steroid injections, we can start to see decrease in efficacy, we can start to see increased cartilage degeneration, and they do have their place, uh, but they also have other effects, including weakening of uh, tendons and, again, accelerating uh, degenerative changes, which can ultimately lead to worsening of osteoarthritis, and sometimes they can only go so far. Uh, Beyond this, sometimes we can do visco supplementation, but many carriers don't cover this as a treatment uh, for shoulder pain. And oftentimes this, again, is uncovered and out of pocket for the patient. After that, really in the past, we've been left with surgery. Uh, more recently, I would say there's been a uh, burgeoning renaissance of interventional pain treatments and with them, um, several different therapies. We do have the ability to perform nerve blocks now, regenerative medicine and peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, all great options. Uh, we've many times done great uh, diagnostic blocks, which really helps us to identify some particular nerves which may be of interest, which we'll go into here in a moment, namely the suprascapular nerve or the topic of this discussion, the axillary nerve and the lateral pectoral nerve when we're discussing the shoulder. Uh, but oftentimes, as we see with other nerves, uh, diagnostic or even therapeutic blocks with steroids only go so far with longevity of treatment. Um, and so we need something else to kind of uh, treat further on. And so this has kind of left us to ablative therapies. But when it comes to the shoulder, oftentimes there's dual innervation uh, with both motor and sensory. And so we risk um, leaning in towards motor deficits with our therapeutic treatment. And we need to be kind of careful with this. Um, other options for treatment include regenerative medicine, which I would argue can be very helpful. Uh, but again, this is uncovered and the data is still yet to um, be presented fully to us in terms of its long-term outcomes. Now, we do have another option now, which is peripheral nerve stimulation. And I would argue this is um, something that we should consider first and foremost uh, to stimulate before we ablate um, and to consider this earlier on in the algorithm rather than moving on possibly to surgery or re-operations at the surgery uh, on a surgical shoulder um, or surgical releases of the shoulder um, and to do something restorative and stimulate the nerve and kind of retrain the pain pathway um, prior to um, you know, doing more cutting down. Um, and if you talk to many of your patients, oftentimes the biggest complaint that they will have um, is their pain. Um, oftentimes function has improved to a certain extent. And so this is really where we can help them. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about anatomy um, and talking about shoulder pain, shoulder pain encompasses maybe five to 45% of adults nationwide uh, per a 2020 study. Um, and the component of shoulder pain can be multifactorial. And oftentimes, even though we think of shoulder pain as nociceptive from the joint, it oftentimes can also be neuropathic, especially in chronic pain symptom syndromes, um, and where the mechanism of neuropathic pain uh, can be multifactorial. Um, it can be from an osteoarthritis, from primary sensitization, where we have the release of inflammatory meteors, resulting in activation of peripheral nociceptors innervating the joint, i.e. the synovial capsule, the periosteum, ligaments, et cetera, leading to peripheral sensitization and subsequent upstream hypersensitization of the central nervous system, um, then resulting in you know, nerves surrounding the shoulder um, being injured or uh, having a chronic pain 
uh, symptoms. And oftentimes we can see this because when we prescribe medications, they do get some pain relief, right? You'll see patients get improvement with certain over-the-counter medica or prescription medications such as gabapentin or Cymbalta, uh, or they may have pain at rest. And that's why they're responding, right? Because there is a uh, neuropathic component to this pain. Um, other causes of pain to the nerve can be from direct trauma, specifically from a fracture, uh, maybe of the scapula or the humerus, um, or there can be entrapment of the nerve, specifically the suprascapular nerve. Uh, direct nerve compression um, can happen also due to tumors, cysts, uh, or the suprascapular nerve becoming entrapped in the suprascapular spinal glenoid notch. Uh, and the setting of calcification or adhesion to the transverse scapular ligament or engorgement of vasculature, such as the suprascapular um, artery, um, re resulting in uh, inflammatory changes and repetitive microtrauma in a narrow notch. Um, there can also be dynamic compression on this nerve uh, in the setting of a possible supraspinatus injury and repetitive overhead throwing sports, uh, or uh, in surgical cases from dislocation or distraction of the shoulder uh, needed to actually perform um, the shoulder surgery. And we can see this oftentimes, um, it kind of bears on the literature as well, that a large portion of patients do end up having post-surgical pain. Now, if we look at the innervation here of the shoulder, when we talk about the suprascapular nerve, it's a great target because it does give a lot of pain uh, innervation, uh, sensory innervation to the posterior and lateral portion of the shoulder. Um, now the axial nerve will kind of get more of the lateral shoulder and the inferior glenohumeral humeral joint and the lateral pectoral nerve and the anterior shoulder will get the anterior shoulder and anterior superior quadrant of the glenohumeral humeral joint. But if you think about a large portion of patients, they have a lot of that pain in the posterior region into the lateral region, that kind of dull throbbing aching. And if that is your patient, this is an excellent uh, target for you um, with regards to treatment. Um, so next slide, please. So the next step here is really workup. How do you find these patients um, uh, in your clinic? Uh, so this is gonna be the patient with chronic shoulder pain, someone who's got chronic aching pain, they may have dysesthesias, numbness and tingling in that area of the posterior lateral shoulder, or it may just be this uh, dull, achy, non-specific posterior lateral shoulder pain, um, possibly radiating to the neck or shoulder. And often um, this can be accompanied by functional impairments such as range of motion deficits or even muscular atrophy specifically of the affected muscles which are innervated by the suprascapular nerve in this case the supraspinatus and infraspinatus so on physical exam if you see atrophy of these muscles it's really important to derobe your patients and look for that you may see that um, you may see weakness in the suprascapular nerve which can be tested with an empty can test which is where you ask the patient to hold their arm outright turn their arm around and push up weakness would signify uh, supraspinatus weakness, uh, which may be a sign that there may be injury as well to the suprascapular nerve. Um, other uh, muscles would be the infraspinatus, uh, which can be tested um, with an external rotation test out to the side, and weakness there would signify weakness in that nerve. Now, other imaging modalities which we could use would be a nerve conduction test, uh, EMG, uh, would be maybe the gold standard for diagnosing neuropathic pain at the shoulder, uh, but oftentimes I would argue this isn't done, um, or an MRI. And what, in my practice, at least what works as a pretty much gold standard sometimes would be a diagnostic injection. And so I do this under ultrasound guidance with a very small local anesthetic in the clinic. And if this basically covers the patient's typical uh, area of pain and gives them some temporary relief. For me, that tells me that this is a good target. And sometimes it may actually lead to treatment because you kind of cause some distraction of any potential compressive structures on the nerve. Um, so any of these patients in your practice that you've been doing suprascapular nerve box on and patients are getting good relief, uh, a long-term solution for them can be uh, stimulation of this affected nerve. Um, and again, anyone who's had a total shoulder replacement, again, a great um, possible candidate. Now in this workup, for me, at least personally in my practice, I tend to kind of exhaust the normal conservative measures and then I'll move on to a nerve block, uh, very diagnostic. Initially, I usually try a therapeutic one, and then if that doesn't work, I go to a diagnostic block, but not always. And this is part of the issue, which we'll talk about in a second here. I'll also kind of make sure that the patient, uh, in this case, using the NALU system, uh, does a wear study where they kind of have the uh, external IPG um, or battery pack uh, patch uh, adhered to their skin to make sure they can tolerate wearing it and reach it. Um, and for me, the great part about this system is we have the ability to perform an apples to apples trial with the system, then go on to a permanent implant, which arguably uh, is not always readily available or the same. Um, now, when we talk about anatomy and approaching this nerve, 
most of us are kind of approaching from the top and um, we'll talk about this later in the lecture, but usually we'll go from medial to lateral to avoid hitting uh, bony prominences, namely uh, the chromium. Um, and this will kind of give us more unfettered access to the suprascapular nerve. Uh, there are other approaches, but for the purposes of this lecture, we'll talk about that approach. Next slide, please. Okay, so I alluded to this earlier, nerve blocks, do we really need them or not uh, in terms of diagnosis? Uh, there, there have been some studies that have basically shown that even if you get an excellent result or a poor result with a diagnostic nerve block, this doesn't necessarily indicate whether or not someone's gonna do well with peripheral nerve stimulation of that nerve. Uh, the analogy you gave my patients is, listen, if I flooded your epidural space with numbing medication, it uh, doesn't mean that you'll necessarily do well with the spinal cord stimulator trial. Um, but uh, or that, that I would give to the audience here. Uh, but it does give you an indication of maybe the distribution of pain uh, where someone is having. And so I use the diagnostic block not for necessarily in my head therapeutic relief uh, in that area, but more am I covering, are we creating anesthesia in the distribution of your typical pain? Because that means if I stimulate that nerve, that I'll have a good realistic expectation of where that will be. But I'd argue with a system like NALU, now that you have the ability to perform a real trial, um, apples to apples to a permanent implant that kind of may negate the need for this as it's not reliable all the time. Now, certain carriers may require this, um, but I think um, it's important to, to have that consideration either way. So I still do them in my practice uh, as um, some insurance does require it to get it approved and it helps me get a better understanding of the patient's anatomy uh, and they may get relief. But ultimately, I think if you're gonna look at the real response to peripheral nerve stimulation, uh, trial is the real way to go prior to implants. Um, so next slide, please. Great, and so here we're gonna jump into what are the typical requirements for Noridian or Medicare in order to get something like this approved, which many of our insurance policies are based off of. Um, and so I would say, argue that Medicare is usually the most uh, somewhat lenient compared to other carriers, and you'd have to check your local determination coverages prior to proceeding. But typically, you want to document that the patient has had chronic pain in the affected region for at least three months uh, by definition, has failed more uh, conservative measures, and usually this requires at least two documented failed conservative measures, whether it's just therapies, medications, injections, which I would argue by the time many of our patients reach this, they already have failed. Um, and then they need to have typical uh, coverage or inclusion exclusion criteria, meaning they don't have surgical contraindications, they don't have open cuts or wounds or on antibiotics possibly or other risk factors or comorbidities, which would place them at risk for a minimally invasive uh, surgical procedure. Um, and I think you always need to also check for your patients and send them for psychological clearance as well to make sure that they have real ex expectations of the treatments. I talk to my patients about neuromodulation as a form of medication, and just like medications can be titrated and fit to uh, their needs, uh, but that expectation of 100% relief isn't always uh, the best type of uh, expectation uh, and to work with me as we try to optimize it for them and oftentimes we will get them to that level of release where they can get improved function and better quality of life. Next slide please. So we kind of talked about some of this so real considerations when we're talking about doing a suprascapular nerve block um, or and peripheral nerve stimulation is do we need to do nerve blocks? And I don't know the answer um, to this really. Uh, I would argue that I would do them personally and I do just to really figure out the distribution of the pain. But again, this won't lead to a co direct correlation of how successful your peripheral nerve stimulation should be. So if you're doing it to try to figure out the, the exact nerve that you wanna target for the distribution, I would argue maybe do one nerve block followed by another, maybe the suprascapular and the axillary if the pain's more lateral and you're unsure of what you're gonna cover. Um, but ultimately, I would argue that trials are the best way to go in terms of having reliable um, outcomes from uh, pre-implant uh, because you can be kind of duped at times when we do injections and we go to straight to implants. Uh, so my personal opinion, and maybe we can see what some of the other um, presenters feel, would be to first do a trial, then go to implants if available. Um, psych evaluation, you know, is it needed? I think we all, all of our patients have a certain uh, psyche to them. Um, I think it's about, you know, identifying the correct patients in your practice as we've done for other types of therapies and making sure it's the appropriate one for them. And again, if you want to be safe, uh, sending them uh, for uh, psychiatric clearance would be helpful. Also, it helps 
to kind of buy you some time while you work up the patient and get some clearance. Preoperative imaging. So what we mean by this is uh, for considerations, I think it's important to scan your patient. So when I scan my patient, I usually put them in the position where I'm gonna do the procedure. So I personally tend to use a beach chair or I'll go lateral decubitus. So I try to place the patient in this position, make sure they can tolerate it for the actual trial and implants. And it also gives me a chance to scan and make sure I can identify the nerve easily while I'm there. That's when I tend to do an injection. But for me, it's all kind of in one, making sure that we get uh, you know analgesic relief in the correct distribution, as well as to make sure um, that we can identify the nerve and the patient can tolerate positioning. I think when we're considering any type of implantable, it's also important to consider our, our uh, need for advanced imaging. And so currently uh, for MRI imaging, if you're, you know, if the patient is gonna need frequent MRIs uh, or MRIs over the affected limb, in this case, the shoulder, uh, they would not be, the, the if they need an MRI in this location, the device uh, would need to be removed currently if the scanning is at the shoulder. However, the device is MRI uh, conditional and for sites that are uh, outside the coil and very far distal, such as the knee, uh, there are uh, conditional MRI settings which this device could be utilized. Uh, but always speak to your representative and you know go through your case a case situation and whether or not this would be necessary or important for you. Now, when we talk about peripheral nerve stimulation in general, I think patient consideration something much more that we have to consider compared to spinal cord stimulation is the wearing experience because this device. Uh, it's going to be uh, possibly cross, you know, you don't, you don't want it to cross joint lines uh, and the patient, it's going to be usually in a mobile place. So in this case, in an extremity area near the shoulder. Um, and so we want to make sure that the patient is able to reach the area or have a family member that's able to help place the device on so they can utilize the device. Um, I think um, making sure that they tolerate the external IPG and doing a wear study with the sticky pads that they have is very important to make sure the patient is going to be okay with it. Um, I would also make sure in this case, if it's on the left side, uh, that you speak with the patient's cardiologist. Um, as many times, we wouldn't want to maybe place a peripheral nerve stimulator next to an AICD or pacemaker, uh, but again, speak with the cardiologist and the company regarding this. And then lastly, you know, form factor. Uh, this, I would argue that this uh, device is on the cutting edge. This, they actually have an app that can download on Android and iOS onto your phone, which I think for many is very intuitive. But if your patient is unable to use a phone and does not have help from either their family or a nurse's aide, uh, it may be somewhat cumbersome for them to actually participate in the ther therapy just like it is with SCS. Although that being said, I have been able to bring patients in and program them and come up with a few settings and they would come in every once in a while as needed to have things changed. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. All right, and now I have the uh, honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Al Kumar, uh, and he's going to go through our implants itself. Doc, take it away. Next slide, Dr. Ali. Thank you. I'm Dr. Rul Kumar from Oklahoma City. I'm here to discuss some suprascapular tips and tricks. And for me, it's about the four P's for peripheral nerve stimulation. You probably heard it before, it's all about the prep work. And the first prep P is pre-op scanning. So I actually do my first scan in the patient's clinic visit. I do that to study their sono anatomy. I also let them visualize what we're gonna do during the trial and implant process. I believe that has led to a bigger patient buy-in to the therapy. And I think that will lead to higher long-term success for this therapy option for you. Um, the second P is positioning. I usually do a lateral positioning with the bean bag. If you buy enough coffee for the OR nurse, she might let you do a modified beach chair. Um, the third P is probe selection. I use a curved probe always for my suprascapular target. That gives me adequate depth to visualize the notch. I actually switch over to a linear to do the axillary. Um, the fourth P is placement of the IPG. Things to consider are body habitus, daily function, range of motion, especially for the shoulder. You don't want to cross any joint lines. You want to make sure they can access it independently too. Um, that's going to just lead to long-term success and usage of this device. Next slide, Jeff. So on these slides, you can see the suprascapular notch um, on both of them. And how I identify it is I start off identifying the chromium, 
then I shift the probe medial till the notch is seen. And here's a trick. First, identify the needle tip before you advance to the notch. So you might be able to do that by rotating the needle and just creating a hyperechoic reflection. And typically, I start about one half a centimeter to one centimeter away from the probe and identify my needle first before I start going down to the notch. Um, on the second image, you can see the trapezius supraspinatus. You might be lucky to see a pulsation on Doppler, and you know, when in doubt, always go near the artery. Um, it, the nerve is usually pretty close to that target. Next slide. So here's a great case study that I had. Um, this female it was a 38-year-old female who presented with right shoulder pain. She was young. She was a previous collegiate basketball player. She was now a correctional officer, and she was actually considering changing her job um, and going over to more of an admin, a desk job, and she wasn't able to shoot a shotgun or wear a bulletproof vest all day long due to her shoulder pain. She had a pretty extensive surgical history when she came to me. She had two prior shoulder scopes, two manipulations, a humeral head resurfacing, and a right head arthroplasty. The interesting point with me with her intervention history is she, had, she actually failed a block. And I was like, should I still trial her? Um, and I, realistically, I was like, well, what other options does she really have? You know, it's definitely worth a trial at the very least. Um, because in my head, trial is so minimally invasive. Um, it's pretty easy to do, pretty quick. Um, so I was like, for her, it was definitely worth it. Um, and her outcome is very worth it. Next slide. So here is a picture of her, actually. Um, she's a correctional officer, as you can see. In the second image, she's actually wearing the IPG. And, you know, for her, uh, we had to make sure that the the butt of the shoulder was not where the IPG was going to be. So even though we were in Oklahoma, she couldn't bring a shotgun to clinic. So she had to go do the wear study at home. And then there's another great picture of her shooting uh, her, a gun after. And she actually reported back to our office that she's the first female now that got uh, the distinction of triple crown. And she's back doing jujitsu, all due to the Nalu stimulator. And on lethal, actually, she was in tears. And she was like, I never thought I could get back to doing what I love. Um, and the great point, take home point about her is she actually failed a nerve block and uh, she had a successful trial. So it doesn't always preclude trialing a patient at the very least. Next slide. Here's another case, great case I had. This was a little older gentleman, 71 year old gentleman. He's had long-standing shoulder pain, another extensive surgical history with a right shoulder, reverse total, three rotator cuffs, two scopes, and uh, a recent right shoulder exploration. Um, the ortho surgeon was pretty confused on how this patient could have such severe pain and a restricted range of motion. She was actually considering an infection cause, and infection was ruled out with the exploration and her next step was to actually switch out the metal in the implant because he was having so much pain. He had a successful suprascapular nerve block and he had a pretty drastic reduction for the first couple of days. And I was pretty comfortable moving him forward to a trial. And he had a great success story with a trial and implant. And he actually told our clinic now he's shot, I think 200 rounds or 300 rounds a couple of weeks ago in Ohio and went bowling for the first time in several months. Next slide. So here's a picture of, of the patient in right lateral decubitus position. And here I'm tunneling the axillary lead actually over to above their chromium. And then I would bring both leads down. Um, PNS definitely needs a little bit pre-op planning you got to discuss with your OR staff what position the patient's going to be in, what you're going to need for the case. Um, make sure you got the right probe, and everything you do uh, preoperatively is going to make your case go that much easier. And a lot of times you'll spend more time positioning the patient and getting everything ready than actually even doing the case. Next slide. 
Here's another patient that we uh, did a super scap and axillary peripheral nerve stem on, and we placed his IPG infraclavicular. Uh, I remember him coming in on his first visit. He was actually guarding his left arm. Uh, it had a severe range of motion. And, and these cases really get me to buy in as an interventional pain physician, because um, I'm able to do things that I was never able to do before. And another great point is, you know, you're able to create a new referral pattern, a new referral source, because, you know, trust me, these ortho surgeons, they have nothing to offer. And, you know, actually the last patient, how I got that referral source is I told the ortho surgeon, give me your toughest case. Let's see what we can do. Um, and let us, let me show you what we can do with PNS because they're pretty resistant at first. But I think if you succeed, um, you get a big buy-in from them and you're able to tap into a resource you've never had before. Next slide. Again, this is a slide that gets me really excited about PNS because you're able to do things, getting your patients back to doing things they love. And it's created a paradigm shift for me as a pain physician to doing early peripheral neuromodulation. And you know, there's been a sequential wave of innovation in this space over the last decade. And I'm really excited for what the future has to hold for us. Next slide. So we'll just take a pause here to answer the on-screen poll. All right, we'll now transition to our Q&A session here. Uh, one of the first questions that we're having here is regarding uh, osteoarthritis. So how do we treat OA patients? Are these excluded from PNS? Since I'm the only one in the video right now, I'll take that one. Um, you know, I think that we're really rethinking our strategies uh, when it comes to stimulation of a nerve and the actual pain syndrome that we're treating. Uh, we kind of need to shy away from neuropathic versus somatic versus visceral. And we understand uh, what stimulation is doing in general, similar to what acupuncture is doing. I think these pain syndromes, osteoarthritis, they're still innervated by nerves. Uh, you can still disrupt the pathway, similar to what a TENS or acupuncture can do, but we have better ways to do that. Uh, so I think it's all about circuitry and modifying that circuitry. Um, that peripheral nerve to the dorsal ganglion to the spinal cord and second order neurons on the way up and then back down. Um, so really osteoarthritis is perhaps you know, treated very similar to any other neuropathic pain syndrome. It's really about modifying what's happening in the second order neurons and understanding the anatomy from that perspective. So I think the realm of osteoarthritis, we've done one for knee pain, uh, you know, it's really, it's kind of obsolete in my kind of view. Um, I don't think the guys tackle that as well, but in my view, I think that's an obsolete question. I think we definitely tackle osteoarthritis along with other pain syndromes, and the taxonomy doesn't really matter as much anymore. Yeah, well said, Dr. Gaudi, um, and I would uh, echo his sentiment there. Um, try to give a brief background kind of about how I tend to think about it. it you have to imagine, even with osteoarthritis, um, there is some neuropathic mediated pain. And if you think about how we treat other pain syndromes, we think about dermatomes, myotomes, osteotomes, and that's kind of how you should be thinking. There's, you can overlap uh, your treatment algorithm um, to treat some of these nerves and help with these pain symptoms. And I, I've had great success in my practice doing so. Um, and as pain physicians, I think we pride ourselves on really never giving up on treating our patients. And this is another option that we can give to our patients. And I would argue is something we should be offering earlier in the treatment algorithm. Another question from the audience is, can you do this with under fluoroscopy versus ultrasound? I think um, you I can, but yeah, I think you, you definitely can. But I think if you're going to incorporate peripheral nerve stimulation in your practice, um, you need to pick up some sonoanatomy skills and those skills are gonna translate regardless of the target. And if you're gonna do it right, um, you're gonna to have to use ultrasound for axillary. So why not learn that skill set? You know, this is your career. You're gonna do this for the next 20, 30 years. Um, 
So, you know, it's kind of like the Malcolm Godwell rule, put 10,000 hours of what you do. It's your, it's your art, your craft. So I would say uh, develop the skill if you don't have it and, uh, you know, get comfortable by just by scanning as many patients as you can, your employees, that's how you get comfortable. I think that's great advice. And just to kind of piggyback off that, I would uh, say that if you are already a South practice or only comfortable doing uh, super scapular or box under fluoroscopy, and that's something that you're adapted at doing, um, what you could do is kind of combine ultrasound with this, but I would say of all the nerve targets, the super scapular nerve, which we're talking about today, uh, is accessible under fluoroscopy. Uh, it would just be important to perform, uh, you know, good trialing um, and make sure that you're stimulating over the right area, but it's definitely feasible to do so. Um, but it, my personal choice is to do it under ultrasound, which I've found to be very quick and easy um, and something that you can maybe incorporate the use of ultrasound on top of fluoro as you get more comfortable with this image guided uh, trajectory. Uh, you know, I am definitely an ultrasound guy, so to speak. Um, but to the defense of x-ray guidance, for a lot of these nerves that we're talking about are located on bony anatomy. And if you're going to do things on fluoroscopy, which can be done, um, it's been done before in the literature as well, uh, there's a distinct advantage of having multi-contact systems um, to target a small nerve. So it's a technique you can use to put multiple contacts across the scapula, for example, across the notch, will allow you to use one of those contacts that may potentially activate the suprascapular nerve that you couldn't see in a fluoroscopy. And similarly, uh, while I definitely think the ultrasound guided approach to axillary nerve is significantly better than that Arul, Dr. Arul Kumar had mentioned and showed, uh, you could directly do it at the surgical neck of, uh, at the, um, surgical neck of the humerus. Uh, so there are techniques available, but really the beauty of this device comes in because you can use a multi-contact system to find a nerve that you could not see uh, under fluoroscopy, but clearly the advantages of all sample light to see a nerve, place these devices in a lot more clever ways. Um, but x-ray guidance is not a limitation. It's just thinking about your technology and how to best use it to overcome its limitations. To follow up on the case study and also some of the discussions here, what's the approach do you take when doing axillary nerve? And secondly, how often do you do axillary with suprascapular stem, so a dual lead implementation? So I do my axillaries out of plane, short axis. Um, there's a couple of ways to do this. Dr. Galati, I think, showed me one in Dallas too. So there's several ways to do it, but uh, whatever your way is to kind of just stick to it and get comfortable is the main thing. So um, yeah, uh, that's great advice. I, to answer the axillary, I think there are, a couple of different ways you can do it. And I think knowing your system is the best way to kind of uh, get familiar um, with this particular system. I sometimes come from a more posterior uh, trajectory and, and sometimes catch both the suprascapular and the axillary nerve at the posterior shoulder, um, but also can kind of come in plane or out of plane at the surgical neck of the humerus um, and get just targeted access of the uh, axillary nerve. Um, personally, I tend to put in two leads, especially when I'm trialing, um, because although the patient may tell you where their distribution of their pain is, where you stimulate, they may get better uh, coverage with one nerve versus another. Uh, putting in two leads also gives you some redundancy in getting better coverage of the shoulder should, their patient, should your patient's symptoms change and helps to also uh, combat the possibility um, if there's migration in the future, uh, that you'll still have some coverage over the shoulder um, and kind of giving you better broad spectrum coverage uh, to encapsulate, I guess, pun intended here, uh, the entire shoulder joint. I concur. <laughs> this is <laughs> well said, everyone. Uh, you know, the beauty of all sound is you can target these nerves, proximal, distal, when they come to the shoulder joints, really understanding what you're targeting. You may, if you don't need to target the rotary cuff muscles, infraspinous, supraspinous, you can do it uh, at the end for glenoid notch, at the very right of the suprascapular nerves becoming the branches into the shoulder joints. So it's a very good location to maybe capture both axillary and suprascapular nerve that um, Dr. Uh, Ali Mohammed mentioned. So really, it all sounds really helpful, but really what's more helpful is netters. And some of the other anatomy books from the olden days remember where things are and things go. Uh, so you can really take advantage of exactly what syndrome you're trying to treat.
Do you use antibiotics for trial and implant? For intraoperative, yes. Uh, Postoperative, no. They're probably aligned on that as well. There are a few different lead options that are offered as part of the portfolio. What is the decisions between using the timed or untimed or different lead lengths? I always use timed for the peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, I think the knowledge system is pretty slick. Um, it's so minimally invasive when you use a time lead, you just do a stab incision and insert the uh, catheter um, introducer. And um, you can look for the hyperechoic dot right next to the nerve, um, even before you deploy. Um, I think the beauty of the system is always to use the time for peripheral nerve stem. And then, uh, sorry, what was the second question? Uh, differences in lead length in their consideration. Oh, so you for deciding lead length, I let I measure pre-op with the ruler and tape to see where my trajectory is going to go. With axillary and superscap, I usually bring both leads together at the chromium, then I bring it down infracubicular. So you want to make sure you have enough slack for that. Um, so I usually do a longer uh, lead for the shoulder, actually. And just to echo that, right tool, right job. Um, if you're jumping into peripheral nerve stimulation, and today we're talking about that with the suprascapular nerve, you should be using a lead um, that's going to prevent migration, unlike the epidural space, which is, uh, you know, more open and, you know, uh, rigid space. There's a lot of dynamic movement in the periphery, and you need time to keep your lead secured in place. Otherwise, at some point, you will have migration and thus failure of therapy. Uh, so for that reason, I always use time leads in the periphery. Just to echo on that, you know, the wear study becomes very useful in terms of your planning. That'll probably tell you how long your times will be. So the patient will practice where you're going to put the battery. That'll, that'll tell you where your endpoint is. And so really the trial and the wear study is very key here uh, for your final placement of the lead. Uh, that I'm always a, I'm always a fan of times. I'm sometimes I'm always worried about thinking, taking things out. Uh, so that's probably the one consideration. Um, in terms of having the times in place, uh, it might be a little more difficult to remove if, if it's needed. Um, but that's maybe something we can discuss with a patient. But clearly, I agree with uh, Dr. Abdul Kumar and Dr. Ali Mohammed, the times will make it significantly easier for the leads to stay in place. And they're very flexible to allow the tension to uh, not necessarily break those leads. Uh, I hope one day they put them on the eight contact leads too. <laughs> If you could please go in more depth regarding the wear trial or the wear experience, is it necessary and mandatory? I'll just take you know, that first me, real quick. Yeah, go oh, ahead. sorry. Go um, ahead, Dr. Patients Lai. don't want to wear it. So sometimes you can get away with oncology patients just putting a lead in um, because they're used to having colostomy. So in certain populations, I'm not very really helpful, but I'll let Dr. Arun Kumari probably explain the more contemporary and chronic pain world. Yeah, for me, the wear study is actually pretty useful. Um, I, I use it for a couple of reasons. One big thing is the patient education that it provides and also gives an additional contact point with the representative of the company. And really that relationship is vital for the success of any neuromodulation device. Um, so I think to foster that relationship and for them to have a connection without me there, I think is important. Um, also, it gives them a buy-in, I think, into their therapy. They get to feel, they get to touch it um, and take it home and see how it's going to work in real life. Um, and I think wear studies are pretty useful. And it's remarkable to, to me how successful patients are with wear studies because you think they wouldn't want to wear this device, but uh, most of the time they come back and they're just like, oh, this is really easy to use, easy to take on, easy to take off. So um, I think it's been pretty good. Do you need to take patients off blood thinners? I don't. I would follow your, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just follow your society guidelines. Uh, I think it depends on what you're doing and where you're uh, implanting uh, and take your specific patient into account. We'll take about one or two more questions here. This one is uh, speaking towards referral patterns. So. The clinical cases presented are all about shoulder, after shoulder arthroplasty. 
and you mentioned offering it earlier. Does that mean that we should be speaking to get referrals from PCPs instead of orthopedics? And how do you anticipate the approach to this treatment? Well, I, I think it's not that you're offering it instead of surgery. I think it's it's an option that the ortho should be known about. It's also, you know, if you talk to a PCP, what is the number that they see per day um, that's going to be fruitful for you, right, as a referral source? Ortho guys might see 40% post-shoulder pain, um, while a PCP might see two a month. Um, so, you know, for you, it might be more fruitful to go approach an ortho surgeon and say, hey, this is an option we had. Most of them, you know, where I practice, they don't know it's an option and most pain doctors in this area don't even offer it. Um, so it might give you um, an edge with the ortho surgeon and also your competition, really. I, I don't know that I'd be offering it instead necessarily, unless maybe it was a population where it's reoperation, just like repeat surgery for the spine, uh, especially if there was more, you know, diagnostic uh, or exploratory surgery. Um, but instead, right, um, as Dr. Alkamar said, you want to really kind of make it known to your surgical counterparts that listen for the patients that where they had, you know, essentially done successful surgery and there's nothing to intervene upon. There is an option for them. Uh, these tend to be the patients that are kind of troublesome in their clinic because there's not much else to offer them. And now they have someone they can refer to, uh, which is helpful to them and great for you as well. And the uh, final question is about placing the lead. Would you be looking at a perpendicular versus parallel approach for the target nerve? I guess I can take it briefly. Um, you know, you have to really understand your technology and what you're trying to achieve when you're trying to do something parallel versus perpendicular. First of all, they may be not very easy to place a contact parallel to a nerve that's kind of like very circuitous. Uh, and you're really looking as a, instead of using it as a one or two contact positive monopolar type stimulation or making a large field that activates a nerve. Um, so going along a nerve may be helpful in reducing energy when you're trying to do some of these really in interesting novel pathways, but there may be instances where you're not able to do that. Um, but that's where Ashan comes in very helpful. And I'm sure Dr. Ali Mohammed and Dr. Will come back and explain different techniques on how to get the uh, contacts to be more in line with a nerve. Uh, especially in these two uh, locations. But in general, it's very difficult to do that when the nerves are taking these odd routes. Yeah, I agree with everything Dr. Gulati said. I mean, if you're talking about different approaches, maybe to the suprascapular nerve, if you're going in plane, which is the main technique we talked, or, you know, uh, from the suprascapular fossa right here, going from medial to lateral, that's probably the most common way we've done our injections in the past. Um, however, if you are going under ultrasound or fluoroscopy, you can go um, from a caudate to cephalate approach to the spinal glenoid notch and bring the lead kind of parallel to the nerve, which is an alternative approach. Um, and sometimes this can be effective for me if I kind of leave part of the lead more um, posterior and they may catch branches of the axillary nerve. Um, but ultimately, this is this may be an option if you really identify the suprascapular nerve as uh, your main target, you could put in two leads in different directions, go one perpendicular and one parallel, um, or you could kind of uh, put two leads and kind of sandwich the nerve uh, to kind of use the anocap and kind of steer and direct your, your uh, currents uh, like we do in other types of neuromodulation to get best relief. But ultimately, uh, sometimes it may be a little bit of trial and error to get the right parts of the fibers and the right type of stimulation that you're looking for. And that's part of the art, which is peripheral nerve stimulation. Just because you see the target doesn't always necessarily mean that you get the intended uh, analgesic relief that you're looking for. I already want to thank you for joining this webinar. Um, we definitely have a lot of different topics that we like to discuss. And some of your suggestions are always appreciated. Uh, you can send an email to I guess small at nalumed.com or s small, however you want to say it. Um, and uh, October, we'll be having our discussion on the various cluneal nerves and how that can help you um, be very helpful in stimulating for iliolumbar lumbar pain syndromes. Uh, again, I thank you very much to Dr. Arul Kumar. Um, you know, hopefully his Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Thunder finally used some of their draft picks to the good use. <laughs> Dr. Valley Mohammed who's in the Jets territory uh, or Giants territory, either way. Oh. <laughs> Misery loves company. <laughs> and myself. 
uh, you know, I'm a Cowboy fan, so hopefully they're winning. I don't even know. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. And obviously, you can reach out to any one of us when it comes to your uh, peripheral nerve stimulator uh, questions and uh, needs uh, with regarding the shoulder pain and other areas of the body. Good night, everyone.